You know, it's always great to start the day amidst Bauer alums. Nothing tops that, so thank you all for being here. You see, it, it, it sort of happens, I think, more often than we care to think about. And what am I talking about? You have the energy industry, you have oil and gas companies, and you have good, honest, decent, smart oil and gas engineers. And then there's a, comes a story like Enron. Or you have um, you know, honest and smart accountants. And then a story like Arthur Anderson comes along. And you have what I call the 95-5 or the 98-2 um, episode, which is 2% of that group causes problems and leaves a bad taste in the mouth for the remaining 98%. And I really believe that that's what's happening with the NFL right now. But it's in moments like this, it's in times like this, that we need to absolutely remind ourselves that the stories that sensationalize are really peripheral to the talent, the life wins, the character wins that some of the best on the field football players symbolize and bring to the table. And it's in times like this that we need to remind ourselves that you know, life wins can go hand in hand. They do go hand in hand with talent on the field. And that, you know, winning in life is as important to these players as is winning on the field. And I think we couldn't have asked for a better speaker who captures all that than, the speak than Mr. Doug Dawson, who we have in our midst today. I was trying to think about the best way to introduce him. And it's, it's really hard because there's so many different domains and dimensions to this. Finance expert, yay. Okay. Uh, you know, he, he is an expert on financial planning, retirement planning. I'm sure he can rattle off statistics as easily as he can rattle off football statistics. Started his career at UT. We'll forgive him for that. Petroleum engineer, all American offensive line guard who has played more than 100 NFL games with the um, St. Louis Cardinals, the Houston Oilers, the Cleveland Browns, trained under some of the best coaches imaginable. And, and, very important, he chairs the Coach Bear Bryant Coach of the Year Foundation. Okay, now Glenn's looking at me and saying, you had to memorize all these names and statistics, yes. But let me tell you, seriously, in reading about what the coach Bear Bryant, uh, the Bear Bryant Awards are all about, I'm just so honored and feel so blessed that we have someone who is a spokesperson for what coach Bryant stood for all his life. And if you read about what he did and what, he, what the foundation is trying to do, it's trying to groom people who, who are invested in a cause bigger than themselves. Could you ask for anything better at a time like this? And our speaker for today is the spokesperson for this organization. So I really feel like this is a special breakfast this morning, and I want to thank the person who made it happen, really made it, made it possible for us to invite Doug, and that is Glenn Roberts, who is sitting right here. Uh, Glenn is on my advisory board, and I, I want to tell you that I have not seen a more engaged, a more committed, a more invested board than the Bauer College board as it is today. It means a lot to our faculty, to our staff, our students. So thank you, Glenn, for facilitating this. And again, um, join me in welcoming a finance expert, a petroleum engineer, an all-American offensive line guard who trained under some of the best coaches, but someone who believes as much in character wins as he does in Super Bowl rings, Doug Dawson. Thank you. So much. Thanks, Dean Ramchan. Um, let me get a little closer. All right. That way, I don't have to set it on your head, Krista. Is that good? Do I should I use this or not use this? Hello. All right. I'm going to use it. 
Okay. Um, if y'all all, all uh, uh, allow me some, some uh, uh, if y'all will do a request for me, please. And number one, I am very glad to be here. Number two, I'm still a little bit, you know, as a former offensive lineman, used to weigh 295. I'm down to a svelte 260, Mike. I should be about 240, but eating is one of my favorite things. And since I didn't really get to eat my breakfast because I'm speaking, do y'all mind waiting until after the speech to eat so we could all eat together? That's really kind of, Glenn, you just took a bite. What are you doing? You got you to gotta show leadership, man. Man, I see y'all eating and I'm hungry and, you know, whatever. But uh, hopefully, hey, hey, Lotha, don't let them take my food, okay? You, and, uh, you're going to eat, yeah, you, take, you eat my fruit. So, um, you know, it's interesting what's going on in the National Football League and, you know, you've probably heard this saying before, and I'll just throw this out just because Dean Ramchand mentioned, you know, that it takes, as you know, a lifetime to build a legacy, and it takes one bad decision or mistake to lose that legacy, right? And, you know, I, I, uh, my favorite saying to my kids, I have a senior in high school daughter and a freshman in high school son, and my freshman in high school son has done some stupid things lately, and I keep telling him, when Glenn Roberts and I were 15, we never did anything stupid. Remember how, how focused we were on our long-term goals, Glenn, back then? But I'm fond of telling my kids, and, uh, it's, and it's, it becomes kind of a joke, but they understand life is not a dress rehearsal, right? It's the real thing. And they're at an age now where it makes sense to start making some good decisions, and uh, hopefully they'll start doing that. Okay, so I had breakfast with Glenn and uh, Dean Ramchan about uh, maybe six weeks ago or seven or eight weeks ago or I don't know, and uh, they, they talked about me speaking. I do a lot of speaking engagements. I used to do a whole lot, and uh, the, the further you get away from your NFL career, the less people ask you to speak. But um, I used to do a whole lot, and I basically said, well, my honorarium is $10,000, and they both kind of said, well, what do you do for free? And I said, well, I prepare about 10 minutes before, you know what I'm saying? So I say for 10 grand, I spend like two weeks, I, I bring a PowerPoint. One of your guys came up and said, is there a PowerPoint? And I said, that's the $10,000 talk, okay? You're going you're gonna to get the free talk, so do not complain afterwards, all right? No, it is, uh, it is great to be here. I'm just going to kind of talk at you, talk with you. We're going to exchange some ideas, tell you some things, some, a lot, some of the life lessons I've learned from athletics and from, um, and from working and uh, tell some fun stories, and then I'll open it up to some questions at the end. Does that sound good? And if anybody needs to leave, if you do, I will embarrass you, so try to hang around a little bit. You know? It, you know, like in the first five minutes, it seems like you're not enjoying my talk, so try not to do that. I uh, played for the St. Louis Cardinals in my, for the first four years that I was in the National Football League, and, and uh, there was a special teams coach that coached for the Cardinals on Gene Stallings' staff by the name of Marv Braden. And Marv Braden... Um, uh, told a story, this was in 1986, this is my third year in the league, and he tells a story on himself 10 years earlier, and at the time he was a defensive coordinator in the, uh, for San Diego State University. And it was the spring of 1976, and he, uh, coaches work long hours. I think they think the longer hours they work, the better chance they have to win, right? So they come early in the morning, they leave late in the afternoon or early in the evening, and uh, he started noticing out on the track and field a young man that was working out, that was training that was running sprints, running distance, putting the shot, high jump, pole vault. This went on, this went on for a couple of weeks. And this guy was fast, big, strong, great, great looking athlete. And Coach Braden, always trying to, like all coaches, trying to get a little bit of an edge, decided he'd approach him one day when he was leaving late in the afternoon. So went up to this young man. He went up to this young man and he said, son, my name is Coach Braden. I'm the defense coordinator here at San Diego State University. He may not have said son. He may have said young man. I don't know what he said. He said, I'm the defense coordinator here at San Diego State University. And he goes, I would love to have you play football for me. And the young man said, thanks, coach, but uh, I'm not interested. He goes, I'm training to become the greatest athlete in the world. Well, the guy that Marv Braden had approached was a guy named Bruce Jenner. And many of you know what happened later on in the Summer Olympics in 1976. But Bruce Jenner went on to win the decathlon and set a world record and be declared the greatest athlete in the world, right? went on to be on the Wheaties box. He's now married to a Kardashian, right? He's, he's the Kardashian stepdad. So my kids all know, you know, they're always like, you know, it's, it's pretty funny. But, um, you know, and I think about that story and I think to myself, was Bruce Jenner really the greatest athlete in the world? Could he jump the highest? Was he the strongest? Was he the fastest? The answer is, of course not, right? But who, nobody worked harder and did more with their abilities than Bruce Jenner. 
And so I kind of bought into that at a young age. My father used to tell me, and he started when I think I was like seven months old, but I don't think I probably, it, it didn't sink in, Mike, until probably in the eighth grade. But from about seven months on, he would always tell me, son, you're going to work hard when you're young or you're going to work hard when you're old. Son, you're going to work hard when you're young or you're going to work hard when you're old. And I was in about the eighth grade, and I'd been on the B team in seventh and eighth grade, and I'd made kind of average grades, and I'm sitting there saying, you know what? I think I need to start working hard. And so basically, I, that's what I started. You know, I, I went in with my parents and bought a weight set. I made a, a goal for in high school to you know, graduate in the top ten at Memorial. Um, I was sharing, you know, I basically told, uh, I was talking to one of my classmates who's a client of mine. He's a cardiovascular surgeon in Austin. Uh, a guy named Paul Tucker. Anybody know Paul? His son is Justin Tucker, right? So Justin is a kicker for the, uh, played for the UT and is a kicker for the Baltimore Ravens. He's on my fantasy football team. First year I've played fantasy football. I went to an event, but uh, that, that's not, uh, but Paul and I were talking and we were talking about our class rank. And I thought, I had told people for years that I, I graduated, I was the highest ranked athlete that graduated from Memorial because I graduated eighth in my class. And then, you know, one day I was talking to a buddy of mine, Dean Putterman, and there's a bunch of Puttermans running around town. And Dean reminded me he graduated seventh, but he was a swimmer. And I didn't really count, count swimmers as, a, as athletes, but he's really a great athlete. And I thought Paul had graduated ahead of me too, but Paul said, no, I was ninth, Doug, so you were second. But it was just kind of interesting. But the bottom line is I started working hard, set some goals, and literally I tell my son, you know, and God granted me some good athletic ability. No, there's no doubt about it. Quick feet, you know, I ended up having decent size, that kind of stuff. But I really, really worked hard. And nothing happens good if you don't work hard. And I just encourage you all to, uh, to realize that. So the, the coach that Marv Braden coached for was a guy named Gene Stallings. And uh, Gene Stallings was my head coach for two years the, 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 in 86 and 87. And Coach Stallings tells a story about one of his favorite athletes, a guy named Ben Hogan. Who's here, 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 who's here heard of Ben Hogan? Right, so Ben Hogan was probably the greatest golfer of all time, right? Tiger Woods has a chance to maybe surpass him, but he's got to win another. He's got to win a couple more tournaments probably. But uh, one of the greatest golfers of all time. And Ben Hogan tells a story. I mean, uh, Gene, Coach Stallings told a story on Ben Hogan, one of his favorite athletes. And I'm going to miss the year, so just, uh, and, and I may miss a few of the facts, but this, the, the basis is correct, right? I'm going to say it was 1948, you know, early 40s, early 50s. And Ben Hogan was playing in the U.S. Open. And going into the last day of the tournament, he had a two-stroke lead over his old arch rival, Sam Sneed, right? Slamming Sammy Sneed. And uh, he had a two-stroke lead uh, going into the 14th hole. On the 14th hole, it was a par five. And Sam Snead ended up chipping in from about 100 yards out and hitting what's called an eagle. Does anybody know what an eagle is? How many strokes off par? Two, right? So he ended up, after that chipping in for that eagle, he ended up tying up Ben Hogan going into the 15th hole. Um, ben Hogan went on to birdie two more holes. Now remember, they were, the, they, they were their leading two, right? So they're playing together. Ben Hogan went on to birdie two more holes and afterwards, and win the tournament. So afterwards, he's in the press tent. He's getting interviewed. He's getting spoken to. And, you know, in sports, momentum plays a big part. Who thinks momentum plays a big part? I was in the Buffalo uh, Oiler game, right? You remember that game? I think we had like a three-point lead or something. Was it bigger than that? Times 10. That's right. It was times 10 point something. Times uh, 10.66. Good with math, huh? 32-point lead. But um, so... Uh, uh, sorry, I got a little distracted there. I got a buddy on the front row. I should have sent him on the back. <laughs> he's in the, yeah, he's in the press tent. He's being interviewed. Finally, a, a, a reporter said, you know, Mr. Hogan, did you feel like that you were going to lose the tournament? Uh, did you feel like you'd lost momentum and might lose the tournament when Sam Snead hit the eagle on number 14? And Ben Hogan looked at the reporter and says, excuse me? And he said, you know, when, when, Sam, Sam, you know, when Sammy Snead chipped in from 100 yards out and, and, and hit the eagle and tied you up. Did you think you might lose the tournament? And Ben Hogan looked at him with kind of a dazed look and said, well, I, I didn't know he'd hit an eagle on number 14. Oops. Sorry. That's telling me to eat right, so whatever. <laughs> as, I, as I look at my hash browns over there with the ketchup. But um, uh, so, uh, uh, he look, uh, so basically Ben Hogan said, excuse me? And he said... Uh, 
uh, did you think you were going to lose the tournament? And Ben Hogan said, uh, he goes, I didn't know that he'd hit an eagle on number 14. And the reporter goes, excuse me? Uh, what do you mean? And he said, well, because uh, you know, remember in golf, right, they're playing together. They're in the same twosome, right? Do you hit at the same time? No, you wait. So what's Ben Hogan doing? So he went on to explain to this reporter, he says, I wasn't paying any attention to Sam Snead. I was focusing on my next shot, Okay. Well, I don't know about y'all, but for somebody, so I came to the Oilers in 1990, right? And literally, I played, I played right guard for four years. They moved a guy that was the right guard, a guy named Bruce Matthews to center, okay? And then there was a guy named Mike Munchak was our left guard. Great offensive lines, led the league in sacks allowed one year, led the league in sacks per attempt every year that I was on that offensive line. The three of us have 23 Pro Bowls between us. Anybody want to clap? Say, unbelievable. <laughs> 23 Pro Bowls between us. Matthews has 14. Munchak has nine. I have none. <laughs> I really like to talk about the averages and just stick with the averages. But the bottom line is, in life, what you do is you're going to find people that are more talented than you, and you're going to find people that are less talented than you. What God calls each of us to do is what? Do the best that you can do with the ability you have. Okay. Do the best that you can do with the ability you have. One of my favorite Bible verses, Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, do your work hardly for the Lord rather than for men. Whatever you do, you do, do your work hardly for the Lord rather than for men. Whatever you do, do your best, and hopefully for a higher calling. So there's a theologian that uh, used to be in Houston. He was only here for a couple of years, a guy named Buddy Ryan. Has anybody heard of Buddy Ryan? Remember, wasn't he a theologian? But, but, something like that, when he wasn't punching other coaches on the sideline. Many of you know who Buddy Ryan is, great, uh, great defensive coach, uh, certainly a uh, colorful figure. But Buddy Ryan was once asked, who were the best two players he ever coached? And he said, Mike Singletary, and who's the other one? Reggie White. <laughs> yeah, Doug Dawson. Yeah, I'll tell you my Reggie White story, the, uh, playing against him in the hula ball. We came out of college the same year, but I really won't tell you that. But it was uh, the first, two of the first three plays, he, he, he pushed me into Steve Young. And I'm like, man, I probably shouldn't have body surfed till 6.30 yesterday evening because I'm tired and he's good. But um, he said, Mike Singletary and Reggie White. And he says, well, why do you think they were the best? And he goes, honestly, and here's Buddy Ryan's quote, it seems like they're playing for a higher purpose, a higher calling, Right. So generally in life, the people that succeed the most are people that are doing something for other than for themselves, and they're doing their best. Um, and that Ben Hogan story just blows my mind, because I've had a tendency in my life to compare myself to others, right? I mean, I'm relatively successful, but I look at a, a, a guy like Glenn Roberts is worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and I think to myself, oh, did I, did I overspeak that just a little? <laughs> 10 times or 20? No, I'm kidding. No, I'm joking about that. But uh, so don't compare yourself to others. Just do your best. Okay, number three. Uh, so, oh, I was going to tell my U of H story. I've always loved U of H. I've always liked the school. Uh, I played against U of H, and, and I, yeah, none of y'all are old enough. Do you, anybody remember a guy named TJ Turner at U of H? Great player. <laughs> so he was a sophomore my senior year, and he really gave me, I was an All-American, second-round draft pick of the St. Louis Cardinals, whatever, and he really gave me the toughest time that year. But during the U of H game my senior year, I sprained my ankle. And it was the funniest thing, because we had a guy break his leg in the game and walked off the field. And I sprained my ankle, and there's a, you can tear, they have this sheath or something that like, uh, somehow I tore him off, right? But it's not a real major deal, but it's super painful. <laughs> Literally, I got carted off the field <laughs> for a sprained ankle. And then like two, day, two weeks later, I was playing again. And it was, I got a lot of grief for my teammates that I you know, couldn't even get off the field on my own, my own accord. But um, so, you know, that uh, had a setback against U of H. Was playing against TJ. Was probably glad I got taken out of the game, you know, got hurt because uh, he was, it was a tough game. Not too tough. But um, all right, so. I got drafted, you know, worked hard in college, started as a freshman, ended up having some relative success. My goal when I went to the University of Texas to, was to be what's called an academic All-American. You have to have a 3.2 grade point average and be a decent football player. Uh, so as, as Dean Ramchand said, I was a, a you know, consensus All-American, but I was also an academic All-American with a 3.24 grade point average in petroleum engineering, which wasn't easy. The college experience was real different for me. People talk about Austin and Lakes and you know, 20, you know, whatever, 
going out and all that, and all I really did was study and uh, study and play football and play a little bit of that in television. Remember that came out that year? But um, <clears throat> so got drafted the second round by the St. Louis Cardinals. Like most rookies, I sat on the bench uh, until, the, until the 15th game of the season. Who here believes in the power of prayer? Anybody believe in the power of prayer? I do too. The guy in front of me broke his leg. All I did was pray to get an opportunity to play. God's the one that figured out how to make that happen. I didn't pray for him to break his leg. I know what y'all are thinking. So basically, I'm going to get my first start in the National Football League. 15th game of the year. We're playing against the New York Giants. This is 1984. And New York Giants had a great football team. Two years later, 1986, they won the World Championship or the Super Bowl. So I was going to be playing left guard because the left guard is the one that broke his leg. I kind of backed up both guards as a, uh, my rookie year. And so... Um, tell you a little bit about the New York Giants at the time. They ran what's called a 3-4 defense, okay? Is that what the Texans are running now? I think they're running a 3-4, right? So 3-4 defense, if you played high school football or junior high football or whatever, and they used to call that a 5-2 defense, right? But in the NFL and college, they call it a 3-4 defense. You have a nose tackle. You have a defensive end, which in high school you call defense, but over the tackle. And as a guard, I'm uncovered most of the time. So I have a middle linebacker on me. The Cardinals in 1984 had a real balanced attack. We had a pretty good football team. A guy named Neil Lomax was our quarterback. Roy Green, Roy Jetstream Green, and Pat Tilly were our receivers. A guy named Otis Anderson uh, was our running back. You know, the Cardinals, you know, not being a great organization, got rid of Otis Anderson two years later because he was over the hill. And then three years later, he was the, he was the MVP of the Super Bowl <laughs> so, for the Giants again in 1990. But uh, so... Um, I'm playing left guard. We have a middle linebacker. The two middle linebackers to the Giants is a guy named Harry Carson and a guy named Gary Reasons, okay? We threw the ball about half the time, so I had a real balanced attack. In our pass protection scheme, I was responsible. We had what's called dual protection or scat protection, right? So in the NFL, teams will either fan out, meaning the guard will pick up the end and the tackle will pick up the outside linebacker, or you have this scat or dual protection where the tackle stays on his defensive end and I'm responsible for picking up the middle linebacker if he rushes, which in, for the Giants, he never rushed, right? Almost never rushed. And then uh, and, and if he didn't rush, I was responsible for picking up the outside linebacker. So just understand the dynamics of that. Obviously, the outside linebacker most of the time has some speed, right? So on the snap of the ball, you're going to start bouncing outside, keeping your eye on that guy. And if he starts to come, you have time to come back. But you can't, like, look at this guy, stay there, or the guy will kill your quarterback, right? So the outside linebacker for the Giants almost always rushed, okay? Does anybody want to guess what his name was? Lawrence Taylor, right? I don't know why it's just following me. Okay, Lawrence Taylor. Anybody heard of Lawrence Taylor? Everybody's seen the blind side, right? Even young people now have heard of Lawrence Taylor because he was the guy that broke Joe Thimeson's leg. Anybody that can look at, look at that over and over, much, you know, I know you watch UFC fighting, you know what I'm saying? Because you, <laughs> I can't look at it, right? I'm like sensitive in, you know, in real life and all that kind of stuff. But Lawrence Taylor, truly in 1984, the best football player in the world, right? And it's interesting because everybody, that, that, everybody for that game was worried about how well I was going to play, okay? My coaching staff, my teammates, Neil Lomax, very worried, okay? Everybody was worried except for one person. You know who that was? Me, okay? And it's this perspective I developed in life, you know, basically being on the B team and saying, you know what, what, what does God call me to do? Fight, scratch, claw, do my best, and let it happen. Let the results, let the results happen, okay? And that's been what I call my delusional optimism, okay? Literally, when I saw Mike Paday this morning, Mike Paday said, Doug, you look a little chunky, okay? And you've gotten, you look older. And the first thought to me was, Mike must think I'm really smart, otherwise he'd have called me dumb, right? So I thought the positives, right? <laughs> he thinks I'm a smart guy, right? It's a little bit of a joke. The point is delusional optimism, right? Who, there are people in this world that will tell you. You know, it's fun because I'm a financial advisor now. And Glenn and I have a, 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 a joint friend that just had a, had a nice event and made some decent money. And um, I met with somebody yesterday. They started a business, and the business is going so well. And so often, people don't have anybody they can tell because people, a lot of times, people don't want you to be successful. People want to tear you down. People want to, 
you know, a lot of times really, really successful people can't even tell their family members. And um, um, I don't know where I, where I went, what's going with that. Oh, well. Uh, but delusional optimism. So I remember thinking before that game, okay, and I, no, don't tell me afterwards I need medication, okay? So I don't want to hear anybody come up and say, oh, you should be on that ADD medication. Uh, I remember before the game thinking about it does not matter long term in life whether I shut Lawrence Taylor out, fat chance, right? Or I give up seven sacks, obviously I'll be unemployed, okay? Everything is going to work out for the best in my life, okay? And it's this delusional optimism, this optimism, this you know, belief, this very, very strong belief system, and it's rooted in a, in a, in a relationship with God and belief, and, and, you know, but that is what has carried me through life, right? Um, so be delusional optimistic. It's funny because in my third year in the league, I ruptured my Achilles. My fourth year, I went back to training camp, tore my Achilles again, and on August 12, 1987, had my third surgery, okay? was told by doctors I would never play football again. Missed 87, missed 88, missed 89. In the fall of 89, I started working out again just for fun. It wasn't like I wasn't working out, but I worked out a little bit harder and realized after about a month of doing some things that were stressing my body that my Achilles was finally well, okay? Mentioned it to one or two people. You know what? I'm 26, now 89. I was 27 years old. I said, you know what? I'd be in the peak of my career. I think I'm going to basically go play football again. What'd they say? Can't do it. You've been out three years. Guys are bigger, faster, stronger. Can't do it. You're, you're successful. You're doing well in your financial practice, which is true. But I basically said, you know what? I guess I won't tell anybody else, right? So I told my brother, and then about two months later, after gaining about 20 pounds, my parents go, what are you doing? <laughs> you're lifting three hours a day. You're doing all this stuff. And I said, I'm going to tell you something, but if you say one negative word, I won't spend any time with you over the next six months. You know, because, you know, moms, you know, don't want you to get hurt again, right? So basically, um, delusional optimism. Went to training camp, you know, called Mike Holovac. And this is a funny story. And do we have any time? Okay, I'll be done in just a few more minutes. Funny story. So the Cowboys in 1989 were the worst team in the National Football League. They were 1-15. A guy named Troy Aikman was a rookie, and he got sacked 80 times, right? It was ugly. And so I started as a freshman, no, excuse me, as a rookie. And my second year started. Uh, Literally Sport Magazine was going to do this big article about me because John Hanner had retired. I was going into my third year playing very good football, ruptured my Achilles, the, you know, whatever. I called the Dallas Cowboys general manager. Or maybe a director of player personnel, because it wasn't Tex Schramm, but I, I don't remember. But I called the guy, and I said, my, my name is Doug Dawson. I used to play, you know, three years ago, and I'm interested in trying out for your football team. And he said, we're not interested. And I said, seriously, I'm, I, you know, and he goes, you've been out of the league too long. And I said, I'm better than every lineman you have. I said this. I go, I mean, I'd watch them play. They were so bad. I'm better than everybody you have. And he goes, I'm sorry, we're not interested. So I got off the phone. I got a little bit discouraged. Kept working out, kept training. About a month later, my dad says, I thought you were going to call the Oilers. So I'm like, okay. So he spurred me on. I called a guy named Mike Holovac, general manager of the Oilers. And I said, Mr. Holovac, this is Doug Dawson. Do you remember me? And he says, of course I remember you, Doug. He's, and without saying another word, he said, why are you calling me? Are you trying to make a comeback? And I get goosebumps thinking about it today. And I said, well, yes, sir, that is why I'm calling you. And he said, I would love to have you play for me. Now, here's a guy. Who were his two guards? <laughs> Munchak and Matthews, right? Best two guards in the freaking league. And he says he'd love to have me play for him. So, uh, to me, it was a completely a God thing. You know, uh, I was pretty good, thankfully. Went to training camp. John McClain, everybody know who John McClain is if you follow, follow pro football. McClain wrote an article. You know, they write an article that Sunday when you report. You know, talking about training camp, 80 guys reported. They'll say who's, a sure, who's for sure going to make the team, who's on the bubble, who's um, a long shot. He called me an ultra, ultra long shot, right? <clears throat> well, after the first two days of practice, it was just the rookies, plan B, free agents, guys that don't start, report two days earlier, and then the, the starters came in. After four practices, two two-a-days a day, two days of two two-a-days, of two a days, uh, after four practices that Friday night, or that, uh, that, that night, Bob Young says, 
This is the way we're going to train. Off defense trains the offense, the backups do, in training camp. He says, I currently have six starters, my five guys from last year plus Doug Dawson. And so delusional optimism will get you a lot, thinking positive, right? You get what you, you know, I, I always say re, uh, something is reality. Uh, perception is reality, right? And it's funny because I tell my kids, I tell my son, you know, you're better than you think you are, right? Because you need your kids to believe in themselves. I said, I was always worse than I thought I was, right? And, and, and to this day, but, okay, so last thing. So I'm always asked questions about, there was an article right before the Super Bowl about, was the Super Bowl here about 10 years ago now, 10 or 11 years, I think, 03 maybe, 04. There was an article about athletes, athletes in general, and why, and the, and the, and the failures of athletes post-career, you know, in financially, in relationships, et cetera. But mostly, a lot of it's about financial. And you see, you read stories about athletes that aren't real successful post-career. And I've asked, been asked a hundred times, well, Doug, you've been relatively successful. What is it? And basically, when I played pro football, and even to this day, I call, uh, I call it basically what I call false popularity. When I played the game of football, I knew that people didn't necessarily like me for who I was, right? They liked me for what I did, okay? And I learned at an early age, so I was at a speaking engagement, not a speaking engagement, but I was at an event about three years ago, and it was right after Alabama had been hit by those hurricanes, excuse me, those tornadoes. And I believe that was 2011 or 2012, not totally sure. But uh, the touchdown club brought Nick Saban in, okay? And I was sitting with uh, Dave and Becky, and Nick was sitting next to me. I played for the Browns in 1994. My head coach was a guy named Bill Belichick. Nick Saban was our defensive coordinator. So Nick and I sat together at most team meetings just because I was the oldest guy on the team and we were friends. And so sat with him. And, uh, and I'm almost done, uh, sat with him, and then um, he goes up and starts speaking, and he starts speaking on leadership. And I'm on the front row. We're in the front table because Dave's the one that sponsored him coming in. And I'm sitting there, and he said, who was the greatest leader of all time? And he posed a question. So, right, what, what am I going to do? I'm going to basically answer. And I said, Jesus Christ. And he said, right, Jesus Christ. Why was he the greatest leader? He called because it's called servant leadership. And there was that book that was written recently by that uh, guy called Good to Great. And the greatest leaders of our time are, are called servant, are servant leaders that served other people's needs. And what happens when you're an athlete from a young age, and it didn't happen to me at a young age because I was on the B team, right? So, I, I, you know. Uh, but athletes, the, these athletes get treated in such a way that people are always trying to meet their needs, serve their needs. Do, I mean, you go to an NFL football team, they have somebody assigned to the wives. The wives have somebody they can call and say, where do I do this? Or they help you do everything, right? And if you, get, if you start thinking that's what life is about, you're in trouble. Because the only way to be successful in life is serving other people's needs, right? And the more you can serve other people's needs, the more successful you will become. And a lot of times people choose careers where that success isn't financial. It's basically just make it, you know, like teachers and principals and maybe deans. <laughs> you know, serving other people's needs, you can be wildly successful. But in, like in my industry or in Glenn's industry, the more you learn to serve other people's needs, in, in, many, in many times the more money that you make. So I encourage you to understand that find a way to be indispensable to people, and you'll be successful. And I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are successful, all that. But believe in yourself. Work your tail off. Don't compare yourself to others. And try to find, find other people to serve their needs, and things will be good. So that's kind of the, some of the lessons that I learned. Um, and that's it. So anybody? <laughs> You're supposed to have a good open and a good close, and I don't have either, so sorry about that. Uh, Yes, sir. Yes, ready for questions. So you went from, so from leadership standpoint and serve others, you went from Glanville to Coach Party. So, and Coach Party played for Coach Ryan. So I know you got some of that servant leadership from Coach Party. Can you make sure you have connection to the room? So yes. 
Okay, so Je- that's right. I remember that. It was probably the money. My guess is they offered him more money. Um, Jack Pardee uh, died two years ago, maybe. So I was at, at his, I was at his, uh, his, his memorial service. One of the greatest guys, one of the greatest guys I've, I played, I've ever played for. One of the, I mean, treated you like a man, treated you like he, you, you got, you were innocent until proven guilty with Jack Pardee. He always treated you with respect and kindness, and it was a gentle guy. God played, what, 15, 16 years in the NFL. You know, they thought he was going to die from cancer, missed one season, comes back. One of the greatest guys I ever played for. He played for Jack Pardee, also played for Gene Stallings, who played for, I mean, Jack Pardee played for Bear Bryant in, at College Station. The old Junction boys, Gene Stallings did also. So, you know, uh, you know Coach Stallings uh, was a great coach, was a great leader, uh, basically set expectations and wanted you to get to those expectations. You know, his last year, then that 93 season was weird just because Coach Pardee's doing an interview while Bud Adams is hiring the defensive coordinator. You know, it was a real, it caused a real dysfunctional problem because Buddy Ryan did not submit to Jack Pardee's authority. And that obviously caused rift on our team. We had a bunch of talents. So we ended up 12 and four and, you know, whatever. But, uh, yeah, so thank you for uh, training Jack Pardee so well and, uh, and uh, lo- giving him to us as a coach. Yes, sir. Good question. Well, first of all, my buddy, uh, my buddy Stump, uh, Stump Mitchell and Otis Anderson, I basically fed them all week and said, hey, guys, <laughs> check, you know, uh, check my back. He got one sack. I'm going to call it a covered sack because uh, I blocked him pretty long. Uh, but we won 34 to 14. Uh, the guy that, I, that, that had broken his leg obviously came back to training camp next year. I beat him out. He should have stayed the backup because he was making 250 grand a year, but he couldn't stand to be a backup, and so he retired. And so I ended up playing, having a very good season. Uh, I mean, having a very good game against Lawrence Taylor and uh, blocking pretty good. I do. Will, I will tell you this: about a third of the way through the game, he says, "Dawson, quit blanking, holding me." And I'm not going to say blanking. And he knew my name because it was on the back of my jersey. He said Dawson. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and I said, and this is a this is a true story. I said, Mr. Taylor, if I could block you out holding you, I promise you I would. <laughs> but I'm going to hold you and scratch you and leg whip you. It's funny because I'm in really, really good health. And, uh, you know, joints. And I'm a little, a little overweight, but it's not too bad. And I run. I play basketball. I do all sorts of stuff at 52 years old after playing over an 11-year span, you know, nine seasons. But, um, and so I've had people just say, you know, that, that's, you know, look at Munchak Matthews. I mean, most guys are really beat up right? Physically have gone through a lot or whatever, and I'm just in really good health. And so I had somebody recently say, you know, God, how can, after playing that long, he goes, oh, I bet when you played, it just wasn't as rough. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, they used to head slap. He was like, uh, yeah, that's right. It wasn't as rough. The, the, nowadays, they really, it's rough, but um, it was kind of funny. Back then, they could do anything. Head slap. Randy White, when he had bell rushed me 10 or 15 times a game, two fists under the chin. I had to wear a padded chin strap, a, a hard chin strap, and pad it because he had hit you. And I, it, that honestly didn't bother me because at least I knew where he was because Randy White was super, could move lateral so wide. And when he was bull rushing me, I could just, you know, grab on after getting the crud knocked out of you. But, uh, yeah, they could do a lot of stuff. So um, any other questions? I guess I saw one more. Is that it? All right. Thank you very much. God bless you all.